I start recording now, actually. So for you all on here, this is Jonathan Breen from the music shop here in town. It's a local music store. They have five or six different uh, branches around, right? And uh, been in business for many, many years. Uh, they do a lot of instrument rental and uh, instrument sales, uh, electronic equipment, uh, sound systems, everything. Really great uh, store. They've been very supportive of the Illinois Wesleyan Jazz Festival over the years and Illinois Wesleyan in general. Uh, so Jonathan is going to talk today about uh, Step Up Instruments, and he's got some real interesting topics that I hope uh, you'll enjoy. So I'll turn it over to Jonathan Breen. Thanks, Jonathan, for being here. Yeah, thank you, Glenn. I really appreciate the opportunity, and thanks, everybody, for allowing me the, the time to come in today. We actually have a, uh, we have been around for a long time, and thanks for mentioning that, Glenn. This is our 60th anniversary in 2020, wow. so we're excited about that. And we have a, a very strong uh, background with Illinois Westland. Uh, my grandfather, who founded the store, was the first percussion performance graduate from Illinois Westland. So, really? Uh, yeah, so my, both my grandparents went there, and my uh, mother and my uncle went there, and Several of our employees have been through Westland, and so we've got a long history tied into the school there. So uh, it's exciting for me to be a part of it today. Um, if you don't mind, Glenn, giving me the oh, ability sorry. to share screen, sorry, do I'm gonna dive in and do that. Um, so again, as, as Glenn mentioned, Jonathan Breen, I'm the president here at the Music Shop, um, and we wanted to talk a little bit today about kind of the process of going through upgrading your gear, how to go about doing that. Um, I've worked here at the store, uh, both in high school and college, and then I left and I spent 18 years working for the Yamaha Band and Orchestral Division, um, both as a sales rep and as a sales manager there. And so I've had the opportunity to work on, on multiple sides of this front in terms of helping students find uh, instruments, helping artists find instruments, and I love this process. So this is a, a really fun topic today, and you know, especially given the the audience that you have here for um, for this particular festival, um, you know, students who are involved in jazz music, man, finding that voice is so important. And I'm really excited to be able to um, talk about this today. So let me go ahead and pop up my presentation. And we're just going to kind of dive in. And I'll have some time for Q&A in the, in the, at the end. I do a lot of Zoom meetings, but I'll be honest, I have a hard time bouncing between my presentation and chat. So if you put something in the chat, I'll catch it at the end. <laughs> well, I'll bring it up if it's a question. Okay, perfect. Yeah. And please do dive in if you want to just interrupt me. We can do that. If we need to go down rabbit holes, I'm happy to do it. Um, so what I wanted to do today was talk about kind of upgrading gear. And first question, of course, is why do you do this? Well, obviously, for a lot of students at the middle school and high school level, uh, who are involved in, in these jazz events, sometimes they're still playing on that beginner model instrument that they started off with. And those instruments are really great for fifth and sixth and seventh graders when they're first developing their chops, first developing their air support, first developing their playing ability. They're designed to be very robust, very durable, um, they're, but they're also designed a uh, little smaller hand positions, smaller bore sizes things to allow uh, the instruments to play really well for somebody who has never played before. Um, also, that's true of the accessories that come with those instruments. Typically speaking, these are lower cost accessories. They're designed to be, um, you know, they're mass produced. And so uh, they're designed to be, again, something to keep the cost of those instruments down. And consequently, they may not necessarily generate the best tone or, or provide the best playing experience for the musician. Um, as students grow and develop their, their skills, eventually they end up overblowing or overplaying those instruments. And so oftentimes we find that the instrument becomes something that holds the musician back. They're not getting as much enjoyment. They're not getting the best possible tone uh, out of that. And so really that's the main reason for talking about getting better instruments is it improves both the tone of the player and frankly, the experience for the player, they're, they're just more fun to play, more enjoyable to play. You can get more out of them and they'll help you kind of develop uh, into the musician that you can be. So let's talk a little bit about what the process as far as when to do this. Well, first and foremost, usually you'll make the upgrade when a teacher recommends it. This could be your private instructor, your band director, 
Um, but usually it'll be somebody who's familiar with you as a player that will say, hey, you know what? You should think about uh, either upgrading a mouthpiece or upgrading that instrument. Um, oftentimes too, the player will decide this. We usually encourage it when you can tell a difference. Um, beginning students oftentimes can't tell a difference if you put different instruments in front of them or they can't describe how it's affecting how they play. When you finally develop your skill set enough to the point where you can tell a difference that an instrument makes, now you're ready to start shopping. Um, oftentimes this is coinciding with some kind of a commitment to being uh, a stronger player. Um, usually every musician who starts off in instrumental music reaches kind of a fork in the road and sometimes that's very early on and sometimes it's it's later in their in their playing career that they decide yeah you know what this is something i'm really into uh, i love playing this i love uh, the activity and i really want to do more with it and i can justify spending a little bit more money or justify uh, making that commitment Generally speaking, this timeline usually starts about, you know, eighth grade and runs through sophomore to junior year of high school. Um, you know, it's not uncommon for folks to upgrade later on or upgrade earlier, but the vast majority of folks that will make this move from a beginning instrument into a better instrument, um, usually that process happens right in the middle of, of um, you know, the developing player um, in junior high and high school. So then let's talk about what gets upgraded. Of course, obviously instruments are a big thing, right? That's the one everybody thinks about, but let's not forget that you don't have to just go with a new instrument. Sometimes something as simple as upgrading your mouthpiece or your ligature or the reeds that you're playing um, makes a huge difference, can open up the sound of the instrument that you have now and can be a great way to kind of develop into a, a stronger player without having to lay out a ton of dough for, for a brand new instrument. Um, you know, with flutes, head joints can make a difference. It's amazing how much difference a new saxophone neck can make. Uh, a more open sax neck can really open up a horn. So much of the tone quality and the tone color that you experience happens between the lips and that first four to six inches of the instrument, um, whether that's the, the venturi of the trumpet, whether it's um, the receiver of the trombone, whether it's the head joint on the flute you know, barrel of the clarinet. Those things are so important to the overall tone that you get out of that instrument. That's where that tone begins. And so oftentimes those are places that you can do an upgrade without actually having to, to plunge into an instrument as a whole. Um, so when you're thinking about upgrading your gear, obviously there's some homework that needs to be done. So how do you go about doing that homework? Well, clearly, you, you know, the internet is the, the great equalizer, right? You go there and start to research. Um, YouTube is an excellent resource. There's a ton of content there talking about different instruments. It's player reviews, artist reviews, people demonstrating instruments, talking about their experience. Um, social media, there are groups for, you know, jazz trombone, jazz trumpet. I mean, there's all kinds of forums there. And these are people who are players, who are teachers that are involved in those forums. Those can be great places for resources are great resources for information. Um, very anecdotal. You know, this has been my experience with this. I owned one of these. I own one of these now. Um, you know, I played on one for years. Here's what I found. Um, really great to get that first person, first hand experience uh, when you go online. Um, obviously, your teachers or other teachers that you know um, are very connected into that world and can say either I play on this or I've had students play on this and this has been their experience and they can give you some great firsthand feedback as well. Oftentimes, um, you'll find other players, other artists, people that you come in contact with and at events like this um, that can tell you what their experience has been with different instruments. Uh, and then manufacturers' websites, um, you know, the big brands that you're familiar with, you can get out there and kind of get on their websites. Lots of, lots of times they have great resources there. Um, one thing that you have to be careful of when you turn to the internet, obviously, is that there is a tremendous amount of information out there and not all of it is good and not all of it is accurate. So you want to make sure if you're sourcing that information from the internet that you take the time to corroborate it, try to find threads of consistency. So if somebody says, you know, this instrument plays um, out of tune in the upper register, 
Don't just take one reviewer's word for that. See if you can find some confirmation of that along the way. Um, there are, there's, the, you know, I'll use buffet clarinets in as, as an example. The buffet clarinet is kind of the world's premier clarinet, right? The buffet R13 model is, um, you know, the most dominant clarinet in the world. But one of the one of the characteristics of buffet R13s is that they are not necessarily very consistent. If you put five or six of them in a row, the five or six will play very differently. And so um, that's a very commonly known piece about buffet, and you'll see that often talked about when people talk about buffet clarinets. Doesn't mean that you shouldn't buy a buffet clarinet. It just means you want to go into it with eyes open that if you play one and like it, it doesn't necessarily mean that the next one will play the same for you. Um, and so you want to try to identify those quirkiness, uh, those quirky characteristics, um, you know, through the internet, but using it through multiple sites. So you're not just taking one reviewer's word at it. Uh, and then obviously retail stores. You know, uh, we run a, a business here and, and this is what we do is, is step up wind instruments. Uh, generally speaking at our stores, we keep uh, close to or over a million dollars worth of inventory in step up woodwinds and brass winds at any given point in time between the three stores. Um, we're not alone. There are other stores like us that do this as well. And we're great resources. Generally speaking, we are plugged in with the manufacturers. We know what the new models are. We may have the new models in stock, and we certainly have the instruments here available for you to come in and look at and try. We'll talk more about that later. So lots of places you can go to get information about the instruments. So then let's talk about where you go to try the instruments. Obviously, if you've got shows or events, if you do something like Midwest or you do jazz events, or if you do any of the guild shows, you'll have manufacturers and retailers there doing exhibits and displays. And oftentimes that's an amazing way for you to get familiar very quickly with a variety of different brands and models because they're all in the same room. You can walk from, from booth to booth to booth and try you know, a dozen or more different instruments and really get a feel for what you like or don't like. Um, if you have friends that own their own instruments or own instruments that you're interested in trying, you know, borrowing a friend's instrument you know, in the middle of a rehearsal or something is, uh, is a great way to get familiar. Um, you know, with, with the instruments that they play. Uh, teachers also, again, this would be your own private teacher or other teachers that you come in contact with. You know, oftentimes they'll give you the opportunity to, uh, to try out an instrument for a minute or two uh, to see if that's something that you're interested in. And then again, stores like ours or other retail stores that stock these, we certainly encourage this. Uh, we're set up to do trials. Uh, it's, it's how we start the sales process is allowing people to come in and test drive the instruments, right? So that's one of your stronger places to go and be able to try a nice selection of instruments. When you're going to retail stores, there are a couple of things you wanna do. Um, first of all, make sure that they're an authorized dealer for the brand that you wanna try. If you have something that you're interested in, try to find an authorized dealer for that product. Usually you can be directed to authorized dealers by the manufacturer's website. So if you wanna try box Stradivarius trumpets, you go to the Bach website, they've got a dealer locator on there that'll tell you who all the dealers in your area are. And so they can pinpoint those and give you contact information so that you can start getting in touch with those dealers and researching um, whether or not they would be somebody that you'd want to shop with. Uh, you want to make sure when you're researching those dealers that they provide the level of service and support that you need as a musician. You know, are they able to do repair work on the back end? Is the repair work of a quality that you would be comfortable with? Um, do they serve your schools? Do they, do they come out and do things within the educational community? You know, is it the type of place that will be able to help you on the back end with anything that you might need with that purchase? And then are they experienced with the type of instrument that you're looking for? Um, there are many, many stores that are authorized dealers but don't stock instruments of this level and will and will gladly special order one for you but essentially what they're doing is ordering it in the box shows up and they hand you the box that's not necessarily the best experience especially if you are not an experienced player and need some guidance in terms of finding that voice or fitting that instrument to you you want to make sure that the store that you're working with has the ability to do that um, so when you get to the point where you're trying out instruments 
how do you go about that process, right? So there's a couple of things to expect. First of all, you wanna make sure that you've got a comfortable and private environment. That's something that you should certainly expect of wherever you go to try. Uh, you wanna make sure you've got staff that again, are very, very comfortable talking to you about these instruments and what they can do for you. You wanna make sure that you've got a nice choice, um, a variety of different brands, a variety of different models, um, that you're not just coming in to blow through a single instrument that you've got a, a wide palette from which to choose. Um, when you come in to do these trials, there's a couple of things that you should prepare to bring. Make sure that you start with your current instrument and accessories. Um, this is home for you, right? For, for the budding musician, right? This is where they've lived for years. They're super comfortable with their instrument. It's how they've achieved the success that they've achieved so far. And so we want to start there, uh, bring those in with you so that you've still got that with you when you're trying. Um, make sure that you've got something prepared to play for the trial. Uh, it doesn't have to be, you know, a printed piece. It can be something that you play from memory. It doesn't have to be a full etude or sonata. It can be little licks if you want to, but you want to have something prepared in your head that's not just scales um, to play. And then uh, bring somebody with you to listen. It, what you hear as a, as a musician on this side of the bell, on your side of the bell, is very different than what is being projected on the other side of the bell. And so having somebody to come in and listen to you play is, uh, is really important. And generally speaking for us, when we have families come in to look at instruments, it's usually the parents that are here. And the parents often aren't musicians. That's okay. Um, they can listen and tell you what they like and what they don't like. In fact, sometimes it's almost more interesting to have a non-musician listen to you try because the way that they describe what they're hearing and what they react to is very different than what you'll have from somebody who is a, a seasoned player. Um, always great to have your teacher with you when you come in and try instruments if possible. I know that's not always possible, but you know, if you're going to try instruments like this and you're taking private lessons, involving the teacher in that process is always important. Um, we usually say if you're going to come in and really look at, at step up instruments, especially if, if you're in that, you know, eighth grade to sophomore year range and we're, we're looking at something that's going to carry you for a period of time and you've not done this before, it's going to take a little while. Um, you know, this is not a 20 minute or 30 minute process. Um, you want to plan a good couple of hours uh, to really get to know these instruments and try a few and make sure that you've got, you know, that you've taken the time to, to go through them with a fine tooth comb. Um, it's a big investment. It's something that you're going to be playing for a long time. Uh, it deserves a, a certain amount of time to go through that process. Now, Sometimes we're done very quickly, you know, it, immediately the instrument speaks out to that student and, and we're off to the races. Sometimes it takes a long time. So again, you know, we usually tell folks somewhere between an hour and two if they ask. And then the process itself is an awful lot of fun. Um, and this is kind of how I do it. There are lots of different ways of doing this. Mine's kind of a variation of a very common theme. But um, the way that I like to do this, if I'm working with somebody on a step up is, I'll have them break out their, their existing instrument and warm up on that. Um, use your existing instrument and all of your existing gear because again, that's home for you, right? So let's get you warmed up on something that you're comfortable with before we start throwing variables into the mix. Uh, now we'll start the process of trying the different instruments. And when you do, you wanna make sure that you're using the same uh, scales, the same licks, the same excerpts, whatever it is that you're playing, that you're playing that same on each instrument so that you're getting that apples to apples comparison. You know, if you play a scale on one instrument and then you play, you know, something out of your method book for another, um, then you're not necessarily hearing the same notes on the instruments and it's harder to, to make that comparison. When you're doing this, stick with your existing mouthpiece setup to start with. Um, so your mouthpiece setup on the new horn, again, fewer variables, right? Now we know the only thing we've changed is the instrument. We haven't monkeyed around with reed strength or ligature setup or, or you know, brass mouthpieces or whatever, cup, cup rim, you know, rim diameter or anything like that. So we, again, are trying to limit the number of variables, at least at the onset. 
from there, then you want to make sure that you're playing in all ranges and all dynamic levels that you're going through the, 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 the whole range of the instrument, trying it in all areas. And as you're doing this, listen for that tone color that you're hearing um, across all the ranges and the dynamic levels. Um, and it's what's interesting when you're working with students who have not done this before is that they don't know how to talk about it. They can hear it, they can feel it, but they're not sure how to describe it. And so it's, it's always good to kind of, you know, when you have a younger musician who's trying instruments for the first time like this, or in a setting like this, to try to pull out from them what they're hearing, have them describe it in whatever words they can come up with. Um, people will talk about, you know, tones being fluffy or, or you know, uh, cushy or breathy. And, and those words will have very specific meanings to that player. And they're not necessarily empirical terms, but we can use those to kind of help hone in on, you know, what do you mean by breathy? Does it mean that it has a thinner tone, that it's a little more airy? And then why might that be? Could be that there's a leak in one of the keys, frankly, and maybe it's not adjusted right for that player. Um, could be that there's a reed strength issue that is causing it to sound airy when the instrument actually would perform better with a different reed strength. So starting off with those terms and descriptors help us to kind of go down the path of, you know, let's isolate, is this something that is really makes the horn not a fit for you? Or is this a variable that can be adjusted and maybe that horn's great, we just need to tweak something really quick. Um, getting them to talk about that. And then the audience, same thing. Um, and again, no matter what the audience, who the audience is, if they're an experienced musician or not, getting them to talk about what they hear also kind of helps that player hone in on, you know, what the sound is that they're looking for. Um, as you play, you want to make sure that you're being consistent, um, that you're, you're, you know, you're playing either the same music, you're playing it in the same order, you're doing it at the same dynamic levels as you're trying different things, um, that you're sitting in the same position, that your neck strap is adjusted in the same way if you're using that, hand position is the same. Again, just minimizing the number of variables that you can. And then make sure that you're taking your time as you go through and play this. I mean, again, it's a major expense. Um, it's a major investment. And for the musician, you're going to be spending a lot of time with this instrument between practicing at home, rehearsals at school, performances, festivals, auditions, all the things that you're doing. I mean, you're going to have an awful lot of time with this instrument. You want to make sure that it's something that's going to work well for you. So take a little bit of time on the front end to make sure that this fits for you well. I like to, when you're looking at multiple instruments, I like to talk about which ones don't you like rather than which ones do you like. You know, you've played three or four instruments. Which one's the one that you could say goodbye to now? Which, ones do, which one do you not need to try again? And you start to eliminate things first. That usually is less confusing to the, to the player because when you say, which one do you like? They like them all. So now you're asking them to say, well, which one do I like better? And it's much easier for them to say, oh, I really didn't like how that one played once I played this one over here, or I really didn't like how that played compared to these two. Perfect, we can take that one off the table now. And now we just kind of home, you know, refined this choice a little bit um, without having a lot of stress of trying to figure out which one actually fits well for them. Um, going through this process, then you're narrowing down your preferences. Um, what do I like? What don't I like? You know, I really like the open feel of, of an instrument. Great. You know, we want something with a little less resistance. Man, I really am looking for a big low end. Perfect. You know, that, that helps us kind of look for specific voices if we know what you're looking for. And you can do that as you start to try a little bit and narrow it down. If you're looking at multiples, and I mentioned the Buffet R13 clarinets. I mean, if I've got six R13 clarinets in with a player, they're identical instruments. The only way you can tell them apart from one another is the serial number. And as you hand the instruments back and forth and are setting them down on the table and you know, kind of moving them around, it's really easy to get confused as to which one you started with and which one was letter A and letter B and letter C or number one, two, three, and four. If you jot the serial number down either in the notes on your phone or on a piece of paper while you're there and then take some notes with that, 
you know, serial number 686 loved the low end, serial number 725 played stuffy in the middle register. Um, you know, that helps when you're kind of going back and retrying things uh, so that you don't get confused. And then once you get down to the point where you have just a handful of instruments, maybe one or two, now you can start throwing in variables. Do we try different barrels? Do we try different necks? Do we try different mouthpieces or reeds or ligatures? Whatever else you're looking for in the day to really fine point that sound. Um, this is great if you're really stuck between two instruments. If you've got two instruments and they both are very, very close and you're having a hard time deciding, perfect. You know, let's try a mouthpiece or two and see if one of them opens up a little bit more given that new variable. Um, that we have in there. And again, take your time. Um, this whole process is, is uh, a big decision and you want to make sure that you give it the space that it needs. Um, it's, it's, we get that and, and we encourage folks to take a little bit of extra time. Okay, so you've gone through this process, you found you know, the perfect instrument for you with the perfect setup, now what? Um, so obviously now we're at the purchase part. Um, just know that if you're, as you're looking at instruments like this, you know, obviously you can always pay cash for something, but there are lots of financing av options available. Um, within our industry, many of the manufacturers will offer 0% financing either throughout the year or at various parts of the year. That's a very, very common thing right now with most of the main, major manufacturers. And so there's a lot of 0% offers available to you or low interest financing options available um, to you. Many stores, ours included, do rent to own options as well. The cool thing about the rent to own option is that it's got a return clause in it so that if you try this instrument for a while and you find that it doesn't work for you, or if that child you know, moved up to a, a, an instrument and then decides not to continue, um, there's no obligation at that point for the parents to continue. They can just return the instrument and be done with that rental. Um, oftentimes stores will limit the models that are available on rent to own. Not everything would be available on this, but many would. Um, so that's something you can explore there. And then for many students who have started off, especially if they're still in that seventh or eighth grade range, they may still be renting an instrument from a store or they may have rental equity built up with that store. So if they go back to the store that they got their beginning instrument from, they may have a little bit of rental equity built up that they can apply towards the purchase of a step up instrument. So certainly you wanna explore that with the store that you're working in. Um, most retail stores will do trade-ins. Uh, I will be perfectly honest, it's very much like cars. We do not pay for the trade-in what you could get typically selling it on the open market. Uh, we will be very upfront with people about that. I think most stores are to say to you that, yeah, for us, this instrument is only worth X number of dollars, but if you were to sell it on your own, you could probably get you know X plus 50 or X plus 100 or whatever that number is um, to get them a little bit more money. Um, many stores will offer the opportunity to do consignment where we will, you tell us what you would like to get out of the instrument and we will put it on our sales floor and sell it on consignment um, for that price point. In some cases, that's, a, that's a, a good idea. In some cases, they have a tendency to sit. Uh, again, we'll be real upfront with customers about whether or not we think their particular instrument is worthy of a, of a consignment. Um, one of the things that we find to be very common, especially if we're talking to high school students is, Many of the high school students are in marching band. And if they march, they don't wanna take their brand new $5,000 saxophone out on the field. Um, so they keep the student model instrument that they were just finishing up with and use that for marching band because all of the benefits of, you know, the improved tone and the improved playability really matter a lot less out on the marching field. I don't mean to denigrate marching band at all. Uh, we all love a good marching show but the tone color of a beautiful instrument oftentimes is lost between the 50 yard line and the press box. So you know, it's good sometimes to just hang on to that used instrument because for the amount of money we could offer on trade or that you might be able to get on the open market, um, the idea of hanging on to that and, and marching with that so that you're not taking your beautiful new instrument out in the weather and out on the field and potentially getting damaged to that um, uh, quickly, we would certainly encourage. 
Uh, and then check with you, whoever you're buying this from. Again, if you're buying this from a, a retailer or an online facility or whatever, you wanna make sure you're clear on what the return policy is. Um, you should have an opportunity to be able to take that instrument out with you, um, take it to a lesson, take it to you know, a rehearsal, play with it a little bit and still have the ability to come back and return it if you find that it sounded great in the trial room, but I get it into the ensemble and I sit in my section and it really doesn't blend well with the section where it really doesn't have the sound that I was looking for, you ought to be able to bring that instrument back and either you know, exchange it for another one or um, you know, switch out to a different model or get some kind of a refund on that um, you know, if that instrument doesn't perform the way that you expect it to. So you want to make sure you know that. That's also kind of a, um, if you're sourcing the instrument from like eBay or, or Reverb or one of the marketplace sites where there's a lot of buying and selling of used gear, um, we would certainly encourage you to, you know, be cautious there because usually if you buy it from an individual, you know, once you've bought it, it's yours. Um, you know, you're stuck with that instrument, regardless of what kind of repair it may need or how it plays or whatever. So you want to make sure that you have it taken a look at uh, very closely from that perspective. And then that brings up the concept of resale value. Um, again, any retailer ought to be able to give you a reasonable idea of what to expect for resale. How well do these brands or models hold their value? Um, obviously, all of that is dependent upon the condition and the use on the instrument. So there's a lot of caveats that go with that. But you would certainly want to ask about that. Is, you know, is, is this something that is well sought after in the used market? Um, there are certain models, as most of the educators on this call will know, that are so highly sought after by collectors that actually they increase in value. You know, you buy them and use them, and over time, you know, you might get more out of them on the back end than you actually paid for. Those are few and far between anymore. But, um, but there is a possibility that the resale value will hold very well on certain instruments where other instruments, maybe we wouldn't expect that. So we are in a brave new world uh, right now in terms of, of music and performance and practicing and rehearsals. Um, that also carries over into trials of instruments. Um, so during COVID and, and while we're in the middle of the pandemic, there are some specific things we should touch on. Um, one of the things that we're doing now at our stores is we're scheduling appointments for instrument trial. We don't want people just walking in and pulling instruments off the wall and blowing through them in the open air of the store. We actually have specific rooms set aside where we have uh, air purifiers running and, and we're wiping down those surfaces more frequently and we've set them up for instrument trials during the pandemic. And so we're asking that people schedule appointments to come in. We're happy to do it. We just want to know ahead of time that they're coming so that we can make sure the room is prepared for them and that we have it reserved for that trial. Um, as you're talking with whomever you're trying these through, you do want to ask about what their safety protocols are. Um, you know, what do they expect from you? Um, are they going to take your temperature when you come in? Are you comfortable with that? Do they only allow one person in the room at a time? Are you comfortable with that? Um, you know, you want to find out what their requirements are if you're going to go in and try right now. Um, instruments are safe to be tried. There have been many studies over the last six to 10 months um, about, you know, both aerosol production and how to go about playing in a closed space and also instrument sanitization on the back end and making sure that those instruments can be handled safely on the back end. Um, we have uh, instituted a variety of protocols, which I won't go into here because every store is different, um, but you can reach out to those stores and say, hey, what are you doing to make sure that these instruments are safe to, to test? Um, one variable that usually we will offer at our stores is, if a teacher says, hey, I've got a student, can I bring in some instruments to their lesson and have them try them? Or this student's going to come in and buy an instrument, but I would like to see it and hear it before we sign off on it officially. Um, we will oftentimes allow instruments to go out in the care of the teachers, whether that be the private teachers in their studios at home, or whether that be in the band rooms where directors who are, you know, we call on that are many, many miles from the stores would like us to bring a collection of instruments out because their kids aren't going to travel into town to come 
uh, look at instruments. We will typically do that. Right now, we're not doing much of that. It's very rare, just because again, in order for us to control the environment that the instruments are in and make sure that they are not you know, putting put into a scenario where they would put anybody at risk, um, you know, we we've, we've altered our protocols a little bit. So you just you may want to reach out to that person or that that store if you're going to go through the process of looking now to find out what they're doing differently. Uh, and then a couple of inside tips. These are things that, that aren't widely known. Um, we carry a tremendous wide range of instruments within our stores. We do not carry every brand and model uh, that exists out there. I do not have a lot of English horns. <laughs> In fact, I don't know that I have one uh, English horn here. But if somebody wants to try English horns, by golly, we can get English horns in for them to try. Um, our relationship with our manufacturers is such that, um, generally speaking, with almost all of the manufacturers, we can reach out to them and arrange to get something in. Uh, I had a customer looking for piccolo trumpets not too long ago, and we do stock picks, but we only had a couple of them, and they were looking for some very specific brands and models that we didn't have. I was able to arrange to get those in from the manufacturer. It, it took a little window of time to get them here but they were happy to send them in for this customer to try. And we were able to put them in a room with seven piccolo trumpets, which again is not a common experience. Um, and we were able to pull that together for them based upon the fact that we've got great working relationships with our suppliers. So know that, that many stores will be able to do that for you. If you can be a little patient, they can get something in for you to try. Um, as I mentioned before, you know it's not uncommon for us to send instruments into collegiate studios or private teachers studios or, or, you know, have the teacher check them out for a period of time so that they can test them with the student in a lesson or test them, um, you know, within the studio with a variety of different students. Uh, so just know that, that that's not uncommon for, for uh, large retailers. Um, B stock or show stock. This is one of my favorites, frankly. Uh, when you go to places like Midwest or Gen or any of the other big conferences that are out there where, where manufacturers are displaying, uh, they bring in a ton of inventory. And that inventory, once they've opened it up and put it on the walls and had people kind of handle it and maybe play through it during the four or five days of that conference, they no longer sell that as new. That's no longer considered a stock inventory. Uh, it's B or C stock inventory based upon the condition of the instruments. And generally speaking on B stock, the manufacturers will sell that inventory to me, to retailers at a little bit of a discount. We then take that discount and pass it along to the consumer. And so you can get an instrument that, that has been played briefly, looks perfect, still has full factory warranty and you might save several hundred dollars on that just because it was used at a show um, or used as a, as a demo product. Um, one of my favorite things to do that we get from time to time is uh, companies will use these for photo shoots for their marketing materials. If they're doing a, a, you know, a new marketing catalog or if they're putting something up on the internet with photos of their product, they take the product, put it up, you know, their marketing team handles it with gloves, they take it and shoot it, and then they sell it to us as if it's B stock when it really is perfect inventory. So you can ask the stores that you're working with if they have anything like that, because oftentimes you can save a little bit of money and it still has all the same bells and whistles and, and still has full factory warranty. Um, and then watch for seasonal sales events. Uh, we do a great big step up sale every year in November. And for us, that's when we have the, the largest selection and we have clearance items there. It's when we clear out old inventory, if we've got things that have celebrated a couple too many birthdays here, um, that's usually when we put our clearance prices on them. So when stores have seasonal events like that, that can sometimes be a great time to shop, especially if you're not in a hurry. Um, along with that, the manufacturers do seasonal promotions as well, periodically. And you know that's a great thing to be able to do too, is take advantage of if they have consumer rebates or if they have special financing or special discounts, we'll do some scratch and dent sales where the manufacturers will send more B and C stock items in from their inventory to, to allow us to show those in case somebody's okay with something that's got a little scratch on the bell or something and save a little bit of money that way. So just be aware that those things happen too. 
And then um, the most important thing as you're going through this process, or one of the most important things is to let whoever you're, you're shopping with know if there are special needs. I can only afford $50 a month. I need to find a, the best trumpet I can for under $2,000. My son is particularly sensitive to um, silver finishes and, and you know, silver tarnishes very, very quickly when he handles it. Um, you know, those types of things. If you communicate that ahead of time, the retailer that you're working with or the company that you're working with will be able to try to help you find something that will fit those needs. Um, most of us are very, very interested in making sure that we um, get the best possible instrument in the child's hands. And so, you know, just because somebody's on a budget doesn't mean that they are necessarily uh, unable to find a really wonderful instrument for that person. Um, we had a French horn here that we had been kind of waiting on for a specific customer. And uh, we had a family come in that, that it was a perfect, it was a, a damaged French horn, got damaged in transit and a beautiful, beautiful playing instrument, but had a, a mar that frankly kept it from, from being something that we would normally put out. And we had a family that it fit perfectly because it was a significantly discounted instrument and they were perfectly fine with the, with the finished blemish, knowing that it was uh, a much better instrument than what they would normally be able to afford. And so we felt great about that. Okay, <sighs> looking at my time, I kept to my 45 minutes, Glenn. I told you I would try to stay 45 and then do Q&A. And, &A. and uh, so I know I've hit you all with a lot of information today. Um, what questions can I answer? I'll stop the screen share for a minute and open her up. Looks like we got a, a one in the chat. Here. Rory's got a question. Go ahead, Rory. Yeah, go ahead. And I'm sorry because it doesn't it doesn't directly relate to the, this process of a student finding instrument. But but I'm wondering big picture, you know, my perception at a university level, mm -hmm. it seems that it seems to me that there are fewer saxophonists and brass players out there. I mean, there's there are fewer students who are coming to our program. Now maybe they're just going to other programs more. But have you sort of studied the the, the over time? Are the number of students of trombone, you know, trumpet, saxophone, is that number increasing or decreasing or anything you can say about that? So I'm going to put my Yamaha hat on for a minute because we actually did do some studies on this when I was working at Yamaha. And what we found was <clears throat> that the number of performance majors was on the decline, um, that that market had become very, very competitive. Um, you know, that, that much like sporting events where you were starting at a much early age to start to hone in and specialize, you know, we found that, that many students who were going into performance and playing at that higher level, you know, instead of starting private lessons when they were in middle school, they were starting it right away when they first got their beginning instrument. And they were doing festivals and competitions in junior high instead of just high school. And, and so that, that, that spear had gotten very, very sharp, but very, very narrow. And so there were fewer people going into performance, but more students going into education. And so the overall number of students um, involved in music was essentially you know, flat uh, from that perspective. And what we're seeing now in our area here in central Illinois is, the, is, the, is there is a decline. Basically, the, the rural communities that once upon a time, you know, you would go through and see very, very strong instrumental music programs, um, you know, go to the South. Centralia was a monster program for many, many years. Um, you know, a, a lot of different programs. Mount Vernon had a really strong program for a long time. Alton, um, which still has a good marching band program, but they were a very, very large community um, there. And now as people have moved out of the rural communities, there are just fewer students. You know, the fewer students enrolled in school, so therefore you have a smaller pool to draw from, so therefore your band programs are smaller. And um, we're seeing that, that decline um, affect the rural programs especially. Um, not so much here in, in the larger communities, Bloomington Normal, Champaign-Urbana, Springfield, those are the markets that we serve closest. Uh, Decatur, we, we serve from the road and, and do a lot of work there. Um, there, uh, we still are seeing good influence 
um, within the instrumental programs, good support from the districts for those programs, um, you know, no decline in, in um, staffing. Uh, they continue to hire people and they're not trying to, you know, eliminate positions or cut budgets there like they do in some of the smaller communities. So, Although didn't the didn't the two marching bands combine? Uh, yes. Normal West and Normal Community are two big high schools that are over two thousand kids each, right? Yeah, and they did that. That was more of a strategic plan on behalf of the directors because they wanted to move up to that next level of of um, competition in terms of band size. So they were competing as two smaller bands and sometimes going head to head by combining it was a larger band size and so they could jump up the class. Okay. Um, I think there were other factors involved, but that was kind of the driving factor was they wanted to move up into a different class of competition and be able to move with them. Um, the, the unit five music program is still a very, very fine, I mean, you know, um, some fine educators, great students coming out of that program and, and very um, vibrant. I mean, you know, they're doing a lot of really good things there. Um, we wish that all of them were that strong, frankly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Champagne, the Unit 4 music program there is very good as well. Um, Urbana had been historically and they've kind of dipped a little bit. Um, it's uh, unfortunate when you have influences like IWU, ISU, U of I, you know, you like to think that those communities will have, you know, these really strong instrumental programs because of the university influence. And I think that certainly does drive but it's, it's a shame when you see, you know, schools like Urbana that are yes. right there with U of I and so many music faculty who live in Urbana. And yet um, the programs are, are not as healthy as they were 10 years ago. Um, down there. And Rory, Jonathan sells, they sell guitars and guitar equipment too, basses, drums, everything. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, sorry, I focused today primarily on Step Up Wins, but a lot of these same trial processes. I mean, again, if you're gonna come in and try guitars, most most guitarists plan on coming in for an afternoon. It's kind of a, the nature of the gig. Um, Just a quick follow up on that, if I could. Yeah. You know, it was really striking to me because, you know, for quite a while, somebody who's buying an electric keyboard, for example, maybe they order it online from a Sweetwater or something like that. Yep. But you know, a guitarist certainly, I would expect that they do what you said. They would come in and spend yep. the afternoon at the store. And I was really struck recently that a well, actually, he's a former student of mine, not too long, you know, he graduated not too long ago, but he was, he emailed me about some new guitar he got, and we were just back and forth, and then it came out that he had ordered it online, I think it was from Sweetwater, he had ordered yeah. it online, never having touched it, yeah. and he got it and was delighted. I, wow, that was su surprising to me. Do, so do you have anything to, to say in terms of seeing the, the future about you know, brick and mortar music stores versus online. And I'm sorry if that's too broad or-, or. It's not at all. Um, in fact, what we did during the pandemic, um, so of course, you know, we were closed like everybody else was for two months back in, in March and April of 2020. And then obviously, you know, kind of limited traffic uh, after that when people were, you know, sheltering in place. And we took that opportunity to go through and revamp our website because Clearly, people now are shopping online in a way that they did not prior to the pandemic, right? It's changed all of our buying habits, um, you know, from that perspective. People are much more comfortable doing the online thing than they ever were. And so we have to adapt to that. Um, I think there will always be room for brick and mortar. I think people will always want to have that experience of coming in and trying the different instruments. It is a very personal choice. It is very tactile. Um, you know, everything sounds, you know, every instrument sounds different. I think when you're talking about the reason you see it with, you know, keyboards, workstations, um, DJ equipment, you know, stomp boxes, things like that, because they're electronics, they are exactly consistent from one to the next. There's not that, that inconsistency. So you can go online, do all the research that you need to find something that accomplishes the tasks that you want it to accomplish get a reasonable confidence in the sound and the quality and just go to Sweetwater and order it uh, and be very confident when that box shows up that it's gonna function exactly as designed. When you're dealing with guitars or clarinets or oboes where you're dealing with natural materials like wood um, you know, and leather on the pads, um, you know, there are 
variations and inconsistencies in that just by the very nature of the fact that it's a natural material. And so um, coming in and experiencing that firsthand so that you really know that this is the sound that you're looking for, the feel that you're looking for, I think people still like to do that. And as long as um, I think we have gotten to the point where we have passed some of the misconceptions that the reason you buy online is because it's cheaper or you get a better overall value. I think people have started to realize that no, you know, the price I pay at Sweetwater is the same price I pay at the music shop. In fact, last time the music shop was a little bit less. And, and so we, we don't get as much of the, well, I'm gonna buy online because it's cheaper. It's more, uh, I'm gonna buy online because it's more convenient or I'm gonna buy online because they have it. Um, you know, sometimes stocking is an issue too. So we have to play that game where, um, you know, making sure that we have the right mix of inventory and stock to encourage people to come in. And then the idea of, of you know, making sure that we can provide it in a convenient fashion. Um, if somebody, we serve schools, we do 400 schools a week. And so we're going north of I-80 and south of I-70 and to the Iowa border and to the Indiana border weekly. And so we have people who live, you know, out by Macomb. I mean, that's a two hour drive from here or down in St. Elmo, which is two and a half from the Champaign store. They're not likely to drive two and a half hours to come to our store to come kick tires. We need to make sure that we have a vehicle to, to uh, get that instrument to them, whether it be that we're willing to send it to the school and let them try them at school, or whether it be that we have, you know, some kind of a virtual trial that we can do and then speak to that customer so that they feel comfortable in ordering that product from us online and that they can do that conveniently just like they can from Sweetwater if we're going to expect to, to continue to survive in this world. Sweetwater has done an amazing job with their guitar department. They've done, they're doing some setups now and being very deliberate about talking about their setup process for just that reason that you described, you know, just so that they can take that guitarist who normally would be a little sketchy about buying something like a guitar online and, and you know, building that confidence in that customer so that that customer feels like, oh yeah, I can get this from Sweetwater. I'm confident that they've done a setup that's as good if not better than what my local guitar shop's doing. And, uh, and again, the fact that your former student had a great experience with that is testimonial to the fact that they're doing good work up there, so.